For more than a century, the haunting voice of the Iron Horse echoed across the land. From the eastern seaboard, over the seemingly endless plains, and through the western mountains, steam locomotives fused a sprawling landmass into a solid nation. Theirs was a call to dreamers of every age, wafting them from humdrum schoolroom or office to fancied adventures on the high iron. Lucky the boy who one day could say he had seen them in action. For by 1960, the age of steam had virtually ended, and the thrill of seeing a mammoth engine at work was to be only a happy memory of childhood. Of all the locomotives in the long history of the rails, one of the greatest was called Big Boy, a name by which the world knew an engine that closed a memorable era in Western railroading. It was the last of the giants. Built as machines to produce transportation, steam locomotives seldom were endowed with grace of line, and then never at the sacrifice of efficiency and power or speed. For those who ran them and serviced them, the 25 engines of our 4,000 class climaxed American steam freight locomotive design. So Big Boy was a railroad man's everyday working tool. But it had romantic aspects too in the dreams of those grown-up youths who, as bankers or teachers or house painters, secretly yearned to trade places with the engineer in his cab. The sight of Big Boy fighting the grades of Wyoming Sherman Hill was to these aficionados a picture more treasured than any in the world's galleries. The shattering sounds from its stacks and the moan of its chime whistle more stirring than any concert hall melody. Rugged and powerful, it was on call around the clock around the calendar to ride a trail of steel as it drew bales and boxes and carloads of the world's goods from east to west to east again. Although its evolution began a century and a quarter before the music of this machine ever rang through Utah's Weber Canyon or drummed across the Rocky Mountain Plateau, Big Boy's true ancestors were more recent. Locomotives like Big Boy were products of grueling schedules versus little engines. surged ahead in the west around the turn of the century, railroads serving that territory found they needed more power for increasingly longer trains. The power problem raised by lengthening a train had long been met by adding another locomotive. Double heading saved time on urgent freight, but it also meant investment in extra locomotives, expensive machines whose periods of usefulness were subject to the rise and fall of business. Nevertheless, it was a grand sight to see a pair of husky little haulers leaving town to the tune of out-of-beat exhausts. museum piece with its six churning driving wheels was new in 1890, it was considered a Samson of the rails. But that was not enough, even then, and soon six drivers grew to eight. Then eight became ten. As more feet were added to the iron horse, Larger cylinders were needed to power them. More steam was needed to work the cylinders. And in this jack-built house on wheels, a larger boiler to supply the steam.
more power brought more weight, which, though it aided traction by pressing the drivers to the rail, required more wheels to distribute it. The longer the locomotive grew, the more it became like a centipede with a stiff neck. It had difficulty following tracks that wound with rivers and mountains. Size also was limited by bridges and tunnels designed for the smaller locomotives and cars that had been adequate in the early days. The same problem came up on European railroads. One answer to the power and size spiral was found by a Frenchman, Anatole Mallet. Far from being a comic character, Mallet was a brilliant engineer. In 1889, he built a flexible locomotive. He made two short engine units, then joined their frames with a hinge pin. An extra pair of cylinders was added to drive the rear unit. A large boiler completed the design. Voila! The railroad world had here a new and useful piece of equipment. It bent in the middle to take curves freely. Being hinged or articulated, engines could be made longer with more wheels to distribute the weight that was the partner of power. The first Mallet used in America, one which railroaders affectionately called Old Maud, ran on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. The Virginian and Erie Railroads went Mallet one better and built locomotives with three engine units, powerful brutes but steam hungry and hard to maintain. Mallet engines like Old Maud also were of the economical compound type. They used the steam twice. It came from the boiler first to the rear set of cylinders at high pressure. Then, as it expanded, it passed at lower pressure into a second and larger set before exhausting through the smokestack. In 1918, we put a number of Mallies to work on heavy grades. True to type with bulging front cylinders, these engines did a good job of pulling, but they were slow movers and hard on track. The moving parts of the front units were so large and heavy that at higher speeds the track suffered continuous and devastating hammering. Like most western railroads, power lines stretch over long distances and speed is essential to maintain good service. To get both the power and speed we needed, we returned in the mid-twenties to the rigid frame engine. The result was the 9000 series, a locomotive of singular design. With 12 coupled driving wheels, it was the largest non-articulated engine ever built. It ran twice as fast as the Mallies, yet used less fuel. The 9000s served well on the plains, where rails curved gently. But in mountain country, where winding tracks resisted stiff-legged engines, their efficiency and power were impaired. So, as early as 1936, using roller bearings and better steels, we revived the articulated type locomotive. The result was the famous Challenger. Unlike the Malleys, the Challengers and their later somewhat refined cousins, the 3900 class, used only high-pressure steam in both sets of equal-sized cylinders. They seemed the final answer to the railroader's dream. But with the threat of World War II, still more was asked of the railroads. A greater hauling capacity was needed, and even these locomotives were found wanting. Big Boy was born of necessity. Now the stretching of the locomotive had reached its maximum. Where the Challengers and 3900s had two sets of six drivers, Big Boy had two groups of eight. Like its forerunners, it had four-wheeled trucks under the front cylinders to lead it through the curves, and under the cab to support the huge firebox. 
Whether it was booming along at 80 or drifting easy, Big Boy radiated majesty. Massive and compact, a solid workhorse, yet limber as a trotter, magnificence was paired with performance. The 4000s were the largest and heaviest of their type ever built, 132 feet long, a million and a quarter pounds in weight. Every inch of Big Boy had the look of irresistible force. Enough, in fact, to pull a loaded five and a half mile long train on level track. Big Boy also furnished power to check the hurtling tons behind it. A common sight on trains descending Sherman Hill was a swirl of smoke streaming from every wheel as the brakes were applied energized by compressed air from the locomotive. There was a family resemblance about Big Boy and the 3900. Heavy jowled with bulky cylinders, each had a bright eye low on a double chin of air compressors. The bell was a forelock, the pilot like a steel beard. A 3900 carried our familiar shield in the center of its space-like smoke box front, Big Boy below the headlight. A distinguishing feature of this type of articulated locomotive was the reluctant manner in which the long, rigid boiler followed the front free-swinging engine unit around a curve. Malley's first little double-jointed locomotive had come a long way. In fact, all locomotives had long before disproved early 19th century scoffers who had said smooth driving wheels on smooth rails would spin futilely. They hadn't considered adhesion supplied by the engine's weight. Although nearly three-fourths of Big Boy's tonnage was on its 68-inch drivers, tractive power sometimes overcame even this force. cylinders, each larger than a 40-gallon oil drum, powered the 16 drivers. Steam at 300 pounds pressure was distributed to the cylinders by valves timed with a mechanical device that created a fascinating counterpoint in motion. The engineer controlled this complicated valve mechanism and could change the direction of travel with an auxiliary machine, the reverse gear. Life in Big Boy began in the firebox, a high-efficiency furnace so large that a human fireman could hardly shovel enough coal into it to make steam for the whistle. A mechanical stoker clawed fuel from the tender, passed it by an Archimedes screw to the firebox, then sewed it across the fire. Within the steel boiler, water circulated around more than a mile of tubes and flues that carried a red-hot hurricane to generate and superheat the steam. With Big Boy's size, two stacks were needed. Hoods to deflect the smoke and permit a clear view from the cab often were used by the engineer. Most of a steam locomotive's life was spent in or near its own special den, the roundhouse. Though sturdy and reliable, even Big Boy often needed attention and service. Better than most engines, its availability for pulling trains still was relatively low. The roundhouse rites began at the end of the run when the fire was dumped and the grates cleaned and cooled. A never-ending job was that of removing ashes cleared from Big Boy's garage-sized firebox. Good maintenance required frequent washing to flush away the grit and grease that always gathered on a steam engine. The locomotive first was pushed through a shower then finished by hand. After a round of inspection that included a search for leaking steam connections, Big Boy was ready for the roundhouse. Once inside, the engine might be there only a few hours while the boiler was emptied and washed. But if heavy repairs were needed, it went to the back shop for perhaps a month 
where first it was disassembled with the aid of a heavy-duty crane. One task was fitting Big Boy with new shoes, steel tires for its drivers, a periodic precision job for back shop machinists with special skills and tools. After being machined, the tire was ready for mounting. It had been bored about an eighth of an inch smaller than the diameter of the wheel center. In a spectacular operation, it was made to fit. Gas flames heated and expanded the tire until it was larger than the wheel. After the tire was driven into place, and before it cooled and shrank to grip the wheel securely, it was gauged for correct position. In another part of the shop, the pipe fitters would be busy with Big Boy's boiler. Tubes and flues, as well as another mile of piping that made up the superheater, often had to be repaired or replaced. There were very few small parts on a 4,000. The tools were equally large and heavy, and the work was hard. It was a rare breed who maintained these giants, like the foreman who retired after spending his entire working life in a roundhouse, then returned to visit nearly every day, like the machinist who set valves on big boys all day, then spent much of the evening building a model railroad at home. To ready a locomotive for the road, once the fire had been rekindled and the boiler was full of steam, all that remained to be done was to add fuel and water. Into the elephantine tender were tumbled 28 tons of coal, enough to heat the average house for many seasons. For the thirsty boiler, the 86-ton tender also carried 25,000 gallons of water, more than enough for a good-sized home swimming pool. With a heavy train, a 4,000 often went through most of its food and drink within the first half of a 57-mile trip over Sherman Hill. It took many people many hours to return Big Boy to the job of moving freight over the main line. Standing docile as the running orders were read, only the quick breathing fire, the droning generator, and the clanking, wheezing air pumps bespoke its latent power. But once the engineer on his hero throne had cracked the throttle to start the tons a-rolling, it took some doing to hold Big Boy back. was a king of the rails who came to life in a fusion of steam and steel. He proclaimed his presence with a rhythmic cough and a throaty cry, belching smoke and trailing steam. He pounded through his domain with a flashing and spinning of rods and wheels. His was an awesome majesty, but he was the last of his line to be toppled by new monarchs of the track. In 
in the 18 years that the big boys reigned, they ran up a total of nearly 26 million miles, hauling billions of tons of freight as prime movers along our wartime lifeline, later carrying the goods of peace and a rising economy. During his final years, Big Boy made his last stand on a short but busy section of our main line, tough, demanding Sherman Hill. And then it was only during the annual fall rush, a few weeks a year. Even as the last wisps of steam were vanishing from railroadings yesterday, Big Boy's successors were ushering in a speed and space hungry era. He gave way as electronics, jet power, and the atom were put to work on the Iron Trail. So Big Boy marked the end of big steam railroading in the West. He was not abandoned because he failed at what he was designed to do but because a more efficient breed of iron horse appeared in the evolution of railroad locomotives. The vital link between east and west that was forged with steam engines is made even stronger today with modern motive power. The day has no end for the railroad, but whatever locomotive progress shall put at the head of tomorrow's train, the rumble and roar of Big Boy will seem still to echo from the high country of southern Wyoming.